Hello and welcome back to the Defined Engagement Bookcast. I'm Doug Fine and happy you're with me today. Today we're coming back with Devin Halliday, the author of Belonging Factor, how great brands and great leaders inspire loyalty, build community, and grow profits. This episode, we're going to be talking to Devin about Chapter 7, A Case for Belonging in a Brand. Again, I want to welcome Devin Halliday back to the Defined Engagement Bookcast, and I hope you enjoy it. Hello! This is Doug Fine here from Defined Performance Solutions. It's a consultancy in Augusta, Georgia. My name is Doug Fine, and I kind of did a little play on my name for my company's name. And I'm here with Devin Halliday. He is the author of Belonging Factor, How Great Brands and Great Leaders Inspire Loyalty, Build Community, and Grow Profits. Devin Halliday, thank you for joining me today for Chapter 7. I'm so glad to be here again talking with you about uh, Belonging Factor and leaders and what leaders and brands can do to, to really ramp it up, especially in this, this culture that we find ourselves in where things are so different than they were a year ago in business, in society, and we still have outcomes we have to deliver in business. Yeah, hugely. I actually saw something yesterday <clears throat> that kind of troubled me a little bit. It said that, uh, and, you know, I listen to people on Twitter and this and that, and they're, they're, they're smart people. But this woman said, you know, we are, um, we're probably capable for the most part, average people are capable of working right now because of what's happening, maybe at about 40% at best. Now that's her opinion, but she also says, but what companies are expecting is 140% right now. And, and that kind of troubled me a little bit because I think she might be onto something there that, uh, you know, it's, it, it's go, 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 work, 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 work. And I think there has to be a new parad- a, a new model about how people are going to work uh, under stress, more stress than ever, under change, changing conditions. How do you manage people when, how do you manage people when people are experiencing things that they've never experienced before, and they have no certainty that 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 this is going to resolve anytime soon. It's just really a challenge for leaders. It's a challenge for employees, staff. Uh, it's a challenge for consultants like you and me. So there's a lot of challenges. I agree, and you know one of the ways to do that is to make sure that the values that you truly believe in as an organization that you say you believe in that that shows up in behaviors and actions and so if if truly valuing your employees and the communities and your employees at the backbone of the company and whatever your value is that that you say yeah show it in your expectations and your behaviors from a leadership standpoint and an organizational uh, practices standpoint so don't expect 140% from somebody who's at home with two kids who are trying to do online virtual school um, and, and their other uh, you know, spouse maybe or, or other person in the house is, is a person who's in an essential function and having to show up in, in potentially dangerous situations every day. And they have all these protocols they have to do in their house to maintain safety. Maybe you don't expect that. In fact, I read some, some really interesting uh, recent articles as well that lended to a few examples of a couple different companies. I won't share them specifically here, but a couple different companies that have, have really gone after a different model, which is we want you to be able to accomplish the work that you need to accomplish in the manner in which you can best accomplish it. Wow. And uh-huh. We don't want you at home, you know, doing the stuff with the kids and then getting on at midnight. Right. Because when it's finally quiet to be able to knock out two hours worth of stuff. We want you to just get up in the morning tomorrow at 8 a.m. and start that again, you know. Um, and what they've seen is actual productivity increases uh, overall because of kind of that, that balance that happens. You have those people who kill themselves that, that then go after the, the, the hard charging and then they become disenfranchised, unproductive. Burned out. out. Whatever it is, burn out. And so that burnout factor is, is disappearing. And, yeah, certainly some people are still feeling – like compelled to go on at 10 or midnight to do some stuff. That's fine. But there's not the expectation 
that that is the case. And so it's, been, it's, it's really interesting because, again, we are, to your point, going through something that nobody's ever gone through before. And belonging factor addresses, I think, some of the key things that are universal. So whether it's an experience you're familiar with or it's a new experience, when you do some of these basic fundamentals, it really doesn't matter if what you're experiencing is new because that fundamental is going to carry you through. Yeah, I think, you know, we've always, we've all, I've always known and believe that insane expectations just alienate people and, and you're, you're, you're already failing when uh, a company, an organization, or your boss is, t is expecting something that is undeliverable unless you kill yourself, unless you are spending 16 hours a day trying to get there, you know? And uh, so I think leaders and companies are, are, maybe they're coming down to earth when it comes to humans only capable of, of a certain amount of output per day. Sure. And, and, uh, and that's probably really ultimately healthy for the workplace, I think. So. And that changes day to day. Right, right. right. So today, today I might be able to give you 15 hours of hardcore brain intensive work. And tomorrow I might be able to give you three. Yeah. Guess what? You, you still got quite a bit of productivity out of me in these two days, right? Right on, right on, I hear you. So today's chapter seven and uh, from Belonging Factor, and it's a case for belonging in a brand. And I thought this chapter was really cool because I know you, I know you well enough to know that you're a drummer. When I met you, you had a drum kit in the back and, yeah. and, and you had a few tattoos, just a few. And I thought, this dude's a rocker, man. I, I haven't heard him play yet, but he's a, he's a rocker. And, uh, and I suspect that this drum kit behind you back then was from SJC Drums, a brand oh, yeah. called SJC Drums. So here, yeah, was I right? <laughs> so, so you're in the club of S -S SJC Drums and uh, I want you, if you wouldn't mind, tell me about how you relate to that brand and why you relate to it the way you do. And sure. then uh, is there any connection that, let's say, let's just, we'll, we'll use, a, you, you bring up the example of another type of company, how they might be able to kind of uh, do what SJC has done in bringing yeah. the brand loyalty to uh, their fans or their family. So tell us a little bit more about your drum kit and then about that company. All right, so I don't, I don't want anybody who's watching right now to go, oh, we're going to talk about drums and I'm not interested in that. We are a little, but I promise you what I'm going to do is talk about how my experience with this brand led to me needing, feeling so compelled to research and understand what it is about how the people who run this cool. company, cool. Um, how, how they have developed something, whether intentionally or not, and you got to read the book to know a little bit more about that. Um, but about uh, how they've developed such loyalty. I mean, beyond loyalty, literally beyond loyalty. Uh, it's, it's, it's incredible. So it, my experience with SJC was this. One of the artists that I really, really like um, and admired his playing was listening to a, a record. And it was the first record where he, he started playing on SJC drums. Yeah. And they, the, the drums sounded so incredible. Now, of course, you know, it's a studio, so I, I could press a button and make any drum I want sound great. Uh, but, but it sounded so incredible. And then I saw him live a couple of times and went, okay, all right, so we're not messing around. This is really good stuff. And I started researching the company. They're a custom drum manufacturer. It's expensive to have them build drums for you. And so, yeah, there's a barrier to entry that, that a lot of people I think couldn't necessarily achieve at that time um, that I was looking into this. And I fortunately was able to, to get into that space and I got my kit and I, it was, it, it started from the moment I placed my order to the, the calls and emails and texts with, hey, you know, we're working on this. So happy to have you part of the family. This is incredible. Pictures along the way as uh, they built. Yes. So I, you see the progress because it it's not like they can ship it out to you the next day they're gonna it's like it. your baby they're showing you yeah. the they're showing you the ultrasound of your drums yes it's kind of like the bentley car buying experience but without spending three hundred thousand dollars so <laughs> yeah so um so then when the drums show up they they come with a birth certificate and yes. they're born to me 
You know what I mean? It's it's mine. It's my name is is who who these drums were born to. You're the daddy. Yeah, and then of course you know down there it's signed by one the drum builder and these other things and and then it doesn't stop there, right? It's it's more this continuous welcoming not just from the company, but then they post on their social media, hey, welcome this person to the family, here's their new kit, so it gets shown off. And then you get all of these messages from all of these people who are part of the family saying, hey, welcome to the family, private messages, hey, your kit looks so cool, this is so awesome, love to hear how it sounds sometimes. Yes. What, what area of the country are you in? Are you in the US? You know, and so you start building this community within this, what they call SJC family. And they don't just call it, they, they treat it. And so that to me was such an incredible experience that I wanted to learn more about everything that goes into this brand and creating that. Because one of the things I noticed in doing my research before I purchased is I connected with and talked on social media with a lot of people who played SJC and they just raved, raved about the owners, the support from the owners, owners of this yes. company. Yes. Um, about the drum builders, about the salespeople, about the marketing people. They knew these people by name. They knew things that they were into. Why? Why would all these thousands of people across the country know this stuff about the people who work at this company? It's because the people who work at that company connect into their people, their customers mm -hmm. in that way. And not just existing customers, but potential, maybe never customers, but just people who are interested, who are maybe fans of the brand, but can't spend $5,000 to buy a new set of drums. So once I got in and really started learning, and I started talking with Mike Chaprari, owner at SJC uh, and co-founder, it was, it, it was clear to me that he, in fact, there's another chapter in the book about this, but he has the joy of a 12 year old who's in their band, favorite band on stage for the first time or the 400th time. And it's just enamored by the whole situation. And that feeling that you have as that 12 year old at that concert or whatever, that's, that's the energy he brings into creating that feeling. But that takes work. It doesn't happen by accident. So it takes work to make sure that if there's an issue or, or a question or concern that you're overdoing it when you address whatever that issue or concern is. And what's really interesting is um, you'll see in another book that's going to be coming out next year called Beyond Loyalty, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mike Chaprari and I wrote. Cool. He, he, uh, he talks about the idea that the community actually serves to both police itself and support and so if a customer has an issue, like a person posts up on maybe the Facebook community, hey, I'm having this issue, this thing's not staying in tune or whatever thing. People are like, hey, have you tried this? This, you know, this is what I ran across, try this thing. And if that doesn't work, hit up Jason or Zach at the company, wow. they'll take care of you and they tag them. And then boom, Zach and Jason are right in there. And so it's, it, it, it's truly an ecosystem of, um, of connectedness. Of well, a, here you go. This is this is where you said brands build community. Correct. You know, great brands build community. And, and that's, it just sounds like a, a, a beautiful community of, of like hearted and minded people that love drums. Anyway, it's very cool, Devin. And I'm really right. pleased that I got to hear about them. Yeah. And, and so, so now take that into your business or anybody else's mm -hmm. business. Um, maybe when it's not a product based business, how do you, how do you well, have, be energized about it can i suggest something can i just suggest oh, like, like i i my, my career was spent in healthcare. what about yeah. a what about a hospital community hospital independent community hospital yeah so service-based everything is about the experience and interaction that you have with the people who are there and if a community hospital is doing it right what they're doing actively <clears throat> in that community in general um in partnering with things that are both visible and maybe behind the scenes to make sure that nobody has an experience that, that leaves them not, not only ever, hopefully never feeling like their healthcare needs weren't met, but that their need to feel part of this community and that this community hospital is part of them, yes. uh, that, that they're not met. And so it may mean things like you have um, a program that, um, that s understands where needs are in community and proactively goes out and supports those areas. Um, maybe once a month or whatever, right? And some right. of the best hospitals do this. They absolutely do this already because 
Uh, for them, it's about what they serve in the community, not 100% what their balance sheet looks like at the end of each quarter. Um, as, you know, it, unfortunately, we, we chose healthcare, so. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> in, in, the, in, the, in the U.S., the balance sheet is more important than any um, other component for the majority of providers. Um, but again, any service industry, it's the same thing. If somebody has no other reason, if a customer has no other reason than what the cost or quality is, then they're going to go shop on cost or quality somewhere else. If, if they feel like the quality somewhere else is just a little less, but the price is a lot less, they'll move. If they feel like the quality is a little better and the price is just a little better or just maybe a little bit more expensive, they'll move. Um, when you eliminate your service or products, um, the human aspect of it, the community aspect, the sense of feeling like I belong here. And this goes back all the way to what we talked about in the, the introduction. You know, there's a lot of people who tattoo SJC logo on their body. I bet you. Yeah. Well, are you going to show us? I'm yours? not. I'm not one. I don't have it. Not yet. Not yet. Mike and I, Mike and I have a, a commitment to each other about something that it may happen one day. However, <laughs> what I'll tell you is <clears throat> um, when you remove the human aspect, the community aspect, and the idea of what that brand can be for somebody in their life and how you're serving them and the community serving itself, um, which is what generally leads to people feeling compelled to get tattoos and stuff like that. When you remove that, now you're just down to price, value, uh, quality. That's it. That's, that's all you're down to. And that is a losing proposition on the long run for almost any, any business. Yeah, I imagine that, um, you know, how people, uh, I, I, I learned of a really great Cadillac dealership down in Texas, and they actually had a, um, a store in New Orleans, too. It's called Sewell and uh, saw a video many years ago. And really it's the lifetime value of a customer that when you take care of them, you know, you, you just go, they went crazy, sort of like SJC drums. They went crazy with their customers. And when you take care of them and you become that community and Cadillacs are the best made cars, blah, blah, blah. You know, you, you're gonna sell them four or five or six in their lifetime and they'll keep coming back to you for their Cadillacs. And, and that's the thing I want to get at this. This is not about throwing money at a problem. You know, SJC, there's no story that is shared in this chapter or in any other uh, place that I've found where they just discount product or they just offer a free this or, hey, you know, you come back. I'm sorry we screwed this one up, but the, on the next thing you buy, we'll give you half off. Yes. You know, we try to do that garbage. There is none of that. Solve the problem and make it right. That doesn't mean throwing money at something, generally speaking, right? Um, and go above and beyond when you do it in some other way. And like one of the examples I think I used in the book um, was just a, a customer who their order was going to be late. It was like, I don't know, 30, 40 days late. It's, mm -hmm. it's pretty late, right? I mean, let's, and understandably upset. So what did the co-founder, what did Mike do? He took it upon himself to not only respond to the issue. He didn't discount the product. He didn't, you know, anything like that. It's a custom product, right? Sure. Um, what he did decide to do was check out this person's social media feed. Found out that this guy loved Batman. I mean, absolutely loves, infatuated with Batman. He went and got a couple of cool little Batman trinkets that he thought would be kind of neat and fun and included them in the shipment once it finally shipped to the customer. And so when, he opened, when the customer opens up his box and gets the, this product that he's been looking for for a long time and has already been you know, apologized to and... and at least addressed in that way, he finds this little surprise. And that little, whatever it was, you know, 12, right. 15 bucks that, that was spent, it wasn't a discount, which doesn't add value. What does add value is recognizing that these people see you as a person. Yes. And they value you as a person, not as a transaction on the other end of an invoice. Yeah. You know, I'm going to, um, I'm going to tell you about a little story about you. You use the term continuous welcoming. And I had a boss once when I was good, the very community hospital I was thinking about. I got hired by Beth Pence, one of the best managers in the world. Um, when I got hired by Beth, she and, and I got hired the same day as another colleague. So we started on the same day. And we were organization development specialists or uh, leader, leadership development people. Um, she started sending us uh, cards 
and she started saying, here's my team. So she, she sent a picture of her team. Here's the team you're going to be joining. She sent us pictures of, here's your office. This is where you're going to be. And we're ordering furniture for you. And when it comes in, I'll tell you what it looks like. So get another card with a picture of your desk, you know, brand new desk, et cetera. Here's your computer. Here's your laptop. And by the way, there was one card she sent. And you know that years ago, they had those little wrists, little plastic wrist things. That yeah, were yeah. She sent each of us a superhero. Like mine, mine was Batman. It was a little Batman, silly little rubber band almost thing. But she says, you guys are superheroes. I can't wait for you to start. It's like, now, th that's just instinctual for a boss to be that way. It was like so cool. Now, you have to learn. I mean, I hope people can learn that. But, but that was so cool how Beth, you know, she continuously welcomed us till we got there day one. And when we showed up, she had a breakfast with the whole, uh, whole HR department, not just her team, but the whole HR department. She invited the CFO, she invited other directors, et cetera. So uh, I know what you're saying, and, and that's really powerful about SJC Drums, how they build a community. Yeah, so, so that example you just gave is a perfect example of, like we talked in a prior chapter about kind of talk the shop and sort of walk the shop and expanding right. emotion intelligence out of a bare minimum action into something that is meaningful for a person and connects that person back into the leaders in the company, et cetera. And so what you just talked about there, not only does that, but now how are you going to think, behave and perform when you're interacting with your internal and external stakeholders and customers, right? You're, you're not going to feel as compelled when you're having a bad day to just let that fly on somebody, you're going to, to behave in a way that emulates your boss. Most people emulate the leaders and culture yeah. of their organization. And so that extends outward into the brand, not just inward into the office and into the, the people. What a yeah. great story. Yeah, it is a great story. I tried to start doing that, you know, when, when I was hiring people down the road. So Gavin, we covered chapter six today, a case for belonging in a brand. Uh, excuse me, chapter seven. Thank you so much again for your time. Uh, people, go out and get this book. It's called Belonging Factor, How Great Brands and Great Leaders Inspire Loyalty, Build Community, and Grow Profits. Thank you, Devin, and we'll see you next time for chapter eight, which is authenticity the other and other shit to consider. That's the one. See, you're rock and roll, I told you, man. I know. Thanks, Doug. Be good. Take care. Thank you very much for going the distance with us today on the Defined Engagement Bookcast. Next week, it's going to be Chapter 8 of The Longing Factor, Authenticity and Other <clears throat> to Consider. You can find more bookcasts as well as the first ones with Devin we did at anchor.fm backslash Doug Fine. And you can go to my website. I'd love you to do that and see what else I do. www.dougjfine.com Dot com. Thank you again for joining me and Devin, and we'll see you again next time. Thanks again, and have a great week.